uh, tonight's program is called uh, The Legend of Medusa. And uh, uh, I, I knew I was going to do this. We'll call him Percy. Uh, <laughs> Perisus. No, Perisus. Close enough. So Medusa the Gorgon, who turns those who gaze upon her to stone, is one of the most popular and enduring figures of Greek mythology. Long after many other figures from Greek myth have been forgotten, she continues to live in popular culture. Learn about the legend of Medusa and her untimely end from Stephen Wilk, author of Medusa, Solving the Mystery of the Gorgon. Uh, Wilk, uh, Stephen will explore the different interpretations that have been given to the Medusa mythology, as well as offer his own original interpretation. He will also examine the history of the Gorgon from classical times to the modern use of Medusa as a symbol of female rage and female, female creativity. So Stephen is a, is a contributor, and, and Stephen, I apologize if any of this is outdated. Uh, Stephen is a contributing editor for the Optical Society of America, and he's the author of two books, how the ray gun, including How the Ray Gun Got Its Zap. He holds a PhD in physics, and has worked on laser propulsion and high energy lasers at uh, both Textron and MIT's Lincoln Labs. And he has designed and built optical apparatus at Opticos Corporation, Cognex, uh, and several other uh, companies, we'll say. Uh, Stephen was previously a visiting professor at Tufts and a visiting scientist at MIT. So all 20 of us uh, here live with Stephen tonight, Let's give Stephen a big round of applause, and Stephen, you can take it away. Thanks so much. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I am a physicist and an optical engineer, and one of the first things you might wonder is, why would I write a book about mythology? I've been fascinated by mythology ever since I was a kid. I read Edith Hamilton and uh, um, Bullfinch's mythology, and I watched all those wonderful movies about Greek myths growing up. And you have to start wondering about why the myths were the way they are. Why, why does Medusa turn people into stone? Why does she have snakes for hair? And shortly after I graduated from, from MIT, one of my professors wrote a, uh, an article about the roots of the myth in astronomy. And I thought I was very impressed by this. And I started collecting articles about uh, Medusa and the interpretations of it and about the art for years afterwards. And eventually I sat down to write my own piece and I realized I had gathered so much information that I had what I thought were completely new insights that he had missed in the original article. There is still a lot of it that's astronomical. I won't be covering that tonight, but I will be getting into the other parts of it. Um, you know, why, why does Medusa look the way she does? And uh, where does the myth come from? Where, where are these weird uh, facets coming from? And that face, which you can see there, that's from uh, a, a uh, piece, a ceramic piece in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. That is a characteristic uh, ancient Greek Gorgon face. And you'll notice it doesn't have snakes for hair. In fact, it's got a beard, which is kind of weird. But it has other features that are characteristic of Gorgons. If you go to the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston, you'll find uh, coins with Gorgon faces on them and other things. And they too, they, they, they have many of these features. They, they lack the snakes, but they have, they're always portrayed full face looking right at you with large oversized eyes, usually a broad nose, lines on the forehead like you'll see there, a very broad, painful looking grin and a protruding tongue. And not only is this the face of the Gorgon, this is also the face of other things all around the world. I'll show you some pictures of them later. And they're used in exactly the same purposes. And you have to wonder why is that? How is that possible? So when I started looking into this, the research philosophy I came up with, I called physical mythology. I think that people come up with explanations for things the way they are. Myths in the first place are as a collection. Myths are a collection of things. There are stories people tell, and part of it is etymology, explaining where words come from. Part of it is history. Part of it is um, uh, natural science. Part of it is religion. And part of it is just uh, explaining why people do things, they know that they do them, but they don't have an explanation for them. And my belief is that these things were originally started very practical. People don't know why they did them, but it worked better if they did. And the myths developed to explain the features of them. Now I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Okay, so physical mythology. 
This is the myth of Talos. The only reason I know about the myth of Talos, well, I know it from uh, Edith Hamilton too, but mainly I know it because of the 1963 movie, Jason and the Argonauts, which is what this is taken from. Talos was a, 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 uh, a metal giant. He was a sta moving statue, you can see him there. And in the myth, he circled the island of Crete every day. And when Jason and the Argonauts tried to land, he uh, tries to keep them from landing. And uh, at least in the movie, he's a giant statue. In uh, many of the myths, he's not necessarily, but he would throw stones at the Argonauts and um, there was nothing to do about him because he's this giant metal man. But um, Jason learns from uh, his patron that there is a single vein that runs through his body all the way down to his heel. And in the movie, he unscrews the cap that holds this on. You can see him doing it there. And uh, Talos is his ichor, his, his magical blood flows out through that. And as a result, he dies. He's grasping his throat there because he can't breathe anymore. And then he collapses to the ground and falls apart. Now that's, that's, that's a very, pretty strange myth too. Here's what this looks like on a fifth century Greek prater. Um, Talos is the figure in the middle there. He's uh, abnormally golden colored. He's got uh, Castor and Pollux behind him, uh, the horseman. And he's uh, already scraped his, uh, his, his heel and he's collapsing there. But um, where do the elements of the myth come from? They come from many different places. Talos is the name of the Cretan, Cretan sun, god of the sun. So it's probably a Greek interpretation of what this means. They interpret him as, a, as a, a bronze giant because bronze is the same color as the sun. And his daily circuit of Crete, he walked around Crete every day, is the same as the circuit of the sun through the sky. But where does the myth of the single vein with a body and the hot eye core come from? Well, one interpretation was that this is in inspired by the lost wax method of casting, Siri Peldu. This isn't, doesn't mean that it's a method of wax casting that was lost. It means that you would make a, a figure in wax and put it into a mold, usually a sand mold, and then you would melt out the wax and you would have a cavity left over in the shape of the original thing. This is from a mid-century um, textbook, scientific textbooks telling you how to make uh, scientific apparatus out of bronze. Um, and it has you filling a cup with this stuff. And then you simply melt it over a burner like you like is shown here. It runs out and then you can fill that space in with uh, molten metal. This shows how it's applied to statues. They would make a core because you do not have the entire statue made of metal, it'd be very, very heavy. So you'd make a core out of clay or sand and then you would cover it over with wax and you would sculpt that to the shape that you want. And then you would cover that over with either a clay or a sand out exterior. And then you would melt this whole thing. And uh, if you did it right, the sand or the clay would stay in place and the wax would all run out. Then you could turn it upside down as shown in four there and simply fill it up with metal again. So that was a practical explanation. Uh, the myth is ultimately based on interpretation of this, this uh, lost wax casting. This was first proposed by Arthur Bernard Cook in his book Zeus about 100 years ago, a very influential good book, and supported by other mythologists, uh, Farnell and Robert Graves. Okay, so let's get to the myth of Medusa. Um, you probably know about Medusa, she had snakes for hair, that she turned people into stone, that Perseus went and cut off her head and gave it to Athena. Possibly you have seen one of the two versions of Clash of the Titans or some other uh, visual version of this. Jim Henson did a really good version of this for his Storyteller series on, on TV. This is an ancient Greek statue of Medusa. This is from the top of a temple. It still has some of the original paint on it. And you can see, see she's holding uh, Pegasus over here under one arm. And she herself has wings. But you see the face is facing right out at you with the broad nose, big eyes, uh, the, the grin and the protruding tongue. And that's characteristic. So the story is, starts out in Argos. And Argos is uh, located right about here. Um, it was one of the cultural centers of early Greece. And there was a king there named Acrisius who had no sons to succeed him. He uh, had a daughter named Danae and he asked the oracle at Delphos if he was going to have any sons and he said, he would not directly have son, but uh, the son of his daughter 
would murder him eventually. Well, he decided he didn't want to have that happen. But he didn't want to kill his own daughter. So he shut her up inside a, a chamber underground and didn't let her see anybody. Uh, she had bars. She could look up at the sky and get air in there, but she couldn't do anything. And what happened was that Zeus, as so often happens in these myths, uh, saw her and fell in love with her. And he came to her through the bars of her prison in the form of a shower of gold. Here's the shower of gold coming down. You can see it says deny, D-A-N-I-A-E over here. Uh, and she's lying on her couch and Zeus impregnated her in this form. And her father was astonished to find that she was pregnant. Well, again, he didn't want to kill his daughter. So here he is, here's Acrisius. He has her shut up in a chest with her son Perseus. This is the carpenter over here who's, who's sealing it up. And um, the end of the chest has these stars on it. That's usually the case. That's connected to the astronomical interpretation. He had her cast into the Bay of Argos here and it drifted. He figured if, if he didn't actually kill her, if he just cast her in like that, he wasn't responsible if she died. But what happened of course, is that she drifted all the way over here to the island of Seraphos where the um, box was pulled out by the fisherman Dictus. Dictus means net, by the way. And uh, he rescued them. And so um, Danai lived with the house of Dictus and uh, Perseus grew up there. And when he became a, a teenager, um, the king of the island, Polydectes, who was the brother of Dictus, uh, became enamored of Danai and wanted to, to have her but Perseus is in the way and he need, needed some way to get rid of Perseus. But Perseus had made a rash vow, not really seriously meaning it, that he would bring to this wedding everybody was going to the head of the Gorgon. And Polydectes held him to his word and said, you had to bring it or else he would be executed. So um, Perseus was in despair, but Athena came to him and offered, her, offered him her help and also the help of, of Hermes, that's Mercury. Um, and he had to get a number of things. The first thing he had to do was to go to the land of where the gray eye lived. These were three monsters who had the form of old women. You can see them here, here, and here. They uh, were blind, but they had one eye that they shared amongst themselves. They passed it from one to another. Perseus needed to find from them how to get to the island of the Gorgons. So he he lay on the ground between them while they were passing the eye from one to the other and he intercepted it. And he wouldn't give the eye back unless they told him how to get there. Here's Perseus again. So um, they told him where to, where, to, where to go and he tossed the, the eye down into Lake Tritonus and he got the gifts of a, a magical helmet of invisibility. He got, um, he had a characteristic sword, the, the harpe. It's a cur got a curved edge on it. He had flying slippers that enabled him to go anywhere, and he had a bag called the Kibisis that he could put things into, and it was intended for him to put the head of the Gorgon into. So he flew to the island where the Gorgons were, and uh, according to the myth as it's told in, in prose, he found them asleep. There are three Gorgons. There's Medusa and her sisters, uh, Stino and Yoriale. Those two were immortal. Only Medusa was mortal. She could only one who could be killed. And he came upon her and cut off her head while she was asleep. But in all the artwork that she's not asleep, she's awake and moving around. And you always see Perseus with this head averted looking away, which makes sense if uh, she does turn you into stone. Uh, you see, in this case, she does have snakes in her hair. She doesn't have snakes in place of hair. Snakes were sort of shorthand way of showing that something lived in the underworld. Uh, Cerberus, the, the hound of the of Hades of the underworld, was often shown with, with snakes on him. And the Gorgons had snakes tied around their waist and sometimes around their arms and sometimes up in their hair as well. And here's Mercury on the side, Hermes, who is assisting him. Here's a, a line drawing of that, same, uh, of that same image. And here's a stone image from another temple. This is, shows Athena on the side, and here's Perseus cutting off Medusa's head. And she's holding Pegasus again over here on the side. And here's moments after he's cut off the head. He's got his curved harpe over here. Here's the head of Medusa in the bag. This is very rare. They're showing the head with the eyes closed. It's almost never shown that way. And here's, here's her body collapsing, and here's Athena. And this is from yet another 
th this is from two sides of the same pot. Here's uh, Perseus with the head in his cabisus going off this way with Athena screening him. And here's one of the other Gorgons with the snake wrapped around her arm. And this is a very weird feature of the myth. Pegasus and a warrior named Chrysaor were said to be born from the neck of Medusa after her head was cut off. That I think too has an astronomical interpretation, but I won't be getting into that now. This is the engraving done by Steel Savage for the Edith Hamilton book of mythology. It's more the way we view these things, sort of romantic. He's flying away with his cloak fluttering like a superhero um, with his shield and here's the head of Medusa all covered with the snakes the way it's shown in much later art. And here are the other two Gorgons down here on the island. Well, as he's flying away, he passes over a rock where the Andro maiden Andromeda has been chained as a sacrifice to the sea monster Ketos. Here's Ketos down here. This is from a wall painting in Pompeii. And Perseus is flying up over here. And so he flies down to rescue her. Here he's flown down and there she is chained to the rock. And this is the earliest depiction we have of the scene. Here's Perseus. Here's Ketos over here looking more like a wolf than a sea monster. And here's Andromeda. He's got the cabisus over here, but he's not using the, the head of the Gorgon to, to kill Ketos. He's throwing rocks at it. And if you look at it, you can even make out the names here. Here's Ketos written in the old um, Corinthian script. And here's Perseus written backwards. The S's are actually sigmas on the sides. They look like elms. And here's Andromeda written backwards. So um, he rescued uh, Andromeda, but Andromeda's former suitor, uh, Phineas, turned Andromeda's parents, um, Tifios and Cassiopeia, against her, against Perseus. And so he was forced to take out the head of the Gorgon and turn them all into stone. And then he flew with Andromeda back to the island of Seraphos and rescued his mother and then flew back to Argos, where he took care, finally, of uh, Acrisius. So that's the, that's the myth of Perseus. Here's another wall painting from, uh, from Pompeii. You can see Perseus here. He's got his harpe, it's barely curved at all. She's got one shackle still holding her to the rock. Here is Ketos expiring in the background. And here's a very, very weird looking small head of Medusa. And I'll get to why I think that is. He's, he's got his, his little winged feet here to carry him around. Okay, so here's the basic myth of Medusa. Perseus went on a quest to kill her the only mortal Gorgon. He gave the head to Athena, who put the head on her Aegis, which is either a breastplate or a shield, depending on who uh, is writing about it. Um, the mystery of the Gorgon is, okay, the Gorgon face, the Gorgon Ion. It's ubiquitous. It's not only all over Greece and Rome, it's all over the ancient world. Where did it come from? Why did it spread? Why, what does it actually mean? And it's using the same function in different places around the world. How is that possible? Okay, and why is the Gorgon ion used in those places? What function does it serve? Here I wanna show you how ubiquitous it is. Here's uh, that face from the Metropolitan that I showed you. This is the face in the middle of the so-called Aztec calendar stone. It's supposed to be the face of the sun. Some people say it's Tonataya, but you have the same features here. You've got the oversized eyes, you've got the characteristic hairdo. Um, very often you've got jewelry in the ears and you have in both these cases, you've got that that, uh, that grin, that painful looking grin, and you've got the protruding tongue. But, you know, that's, this is uh, about 2000 years later in, uh, the, in Mexico, Mexico City, uh, my, about a mile above sea level and way inland. Uh, what does that have to do with this image over here? How can they have the same one? Elsewhere in the world, you've got it too. You have base in Egypt, Humbaba in Mesopotamia, in India, you have at least three, Rahu, Kirtimuka and Smashan Kali. In Southeast Asia, you've got Rangda. In China, you've got the Daoche. In Japan, you've got the Daruma figure. And you've got a whole host of them around the Americas as well. Here's base. Base is not one of the major pantheon of Egyptian gods. He was one of the ones who was among the, the, the lower class, sort of a blue collar god. And he often has sort of animal features, almost like a lion or something, but he always has, he's always depicted face first. In fact, sometimes he's only shown as a face. And he again has lines in the forehead, oversized eyes, the broad nose, uh, the grin and the protruding tongue. Here's a, another picture of a figure of him with flowers. And here's another little statue of him. In Mesopotamia, you had Humbaba. And sometimes again, Humbaba is only shown as a head 
Humbaba is one of the enemies of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest surviving pieces of literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And Ep Gilgamesh's quest to kill Humbaba is very much like Perseus and Medusa. He is sent into the cedar forest to uh, kill this giant who, uh, who strikes people still, if not turned into stone. And he has the help of the gods who uh, blast him with a sandstorm that forces him to close his eyes. And uh, Gilgamesh cuts off his head and brings the head back. And again, it's always depicted with the face looking outwards, never with the face in profile or three quarter view. The one thing that's missing is the tongue, but everything else is pretty much there. In uh, India, you had Rahu. Rahu was one of the demons who was responsible for eclipses. Um, when the gods were making the Amrita, the, uh, the, the nectar of the gods, um, they had it in a cup and Rahu drank from the cup. When they saw him doing this, one of the gods cut his head off. But since it had already drunk the, the liquor of immortality, the head was immortal. And every now and then it sees the sun and it swallows the sun, but, and that's when you have an eclipse, but then the sun passes out through the neck because the rest of the body is missing. So, and that's why the eclipse only lasts a short time. Uh, the Kirti Mukha was put over doorways. There's a, another Kirti Mukha from the back of the statue. And one of the interpretations of Kali, Smashan Kali, also had the very, very long tongue, had the very, very large eyes and the, uh, uh, the, the teeth. In Southeast Asia, you had a witch named Rangda who quote, stole children. They, uh, they still have dances um, where they, they put on a, with a very bejeweled image of uh, the witch. And she's got these huge fangs. She has this very, very long tongue and those big eyes in it. Here's another image of, of Rangda carrying off a child. In China, you had the Dao Che in, that showed up in many places. Here's one of the Dao Che masks. In Polynesia, you had these tiki figures that have the same protruding tongue and were often carved on posts and painted on uh, hut ends. And this is from the Pacific Northwest coast of America. In Mexico, besides Tonataya, you had Tlaltecutli, the god of the dead, who is also always shown in the same way. So. Again, the features, they often appear as a face, they appear facing outwards at the viewer, and they often have a myth explaining how the head came to be separated from the body. Now, the other feature is that the Gorgon parallel is used in the same places as Gorgons. There's something called an antifix. These are these characteristic semicircular terracotta tiles that are placed on the edges of buildings. We still have something like them today. On some classical buildings, people put the same sort of semicircular things along the edge of the roof, um, only they're made out of metal today. They're usually green with verdigris. But back then, they served a very practical purpose. When you make a tile roof, you characteristically make it from uh, two pieces that have sort of curl up in the middle, and then you put a U-shaped piece down over the top so the water doesn't run down in between. And there are vari various variations on this. But you start at the top and you work your way down. Uh, well, actually, you start at the bottom, work your way up, and put the top cap on at the top. But when you get to the when you look at it from the ground, you have this big open hole here, which looks kind of ugly. And in order to cover that up, people put a semicircular piece across it. That was called an antifix. In principle, it could have been just plain, but people started decorating them. Sometimes they'd put a sort of abstract pattern like this on them. But very often they put a face, and usually the face is a Medusa face. Here's a collection of Medusa antifixes from. Uh, from Greece and Greek colonies. Here, here are some more of them. This one's not an antifix, that's that ceramic piece I was telling you about. But um, these are antifixes over here. And there are a few more of them. But the antifixes weren't just in Greece and Rome. Rome copied the idea from, from Greece. You also had them in China and Japan and India. These are some uh, Chinese antifixes. And you see they've got the same kind of face on them. This one's in the Peabody Essex Museum. Um, this is one of the ones from India, it's a Kirti Mukha. The other place they were used was on shields. Um, here's a Greek uh, plate painting that shows, well, it's probably Achilles, although there are other interpretations, but he's carrying a shield. The entire shield is covered with a Gorgon face with, a, again, the eyes and the protruding tongue. Uh, this is the death of Achilles, and that's the shield down there on a Greek pot. 
This is uh, from a standing stone. This uh, says Achilles down one side, and here's his shield. Um, this is a vase painting showing the birth of Athena from the forehead of Zeus. So this is Ares, not Achilles holding it, so just to show you that other people had them as well. And this is kind of weird because according to the Greek myth, of course, Athena accompanied Perseus to get the Gorgon. And the reason that there's a Gorgon face on her shield is because uh, he gave it to her. But here at her birth, there already is a Gorgon face on a shield. Um, here's a Greek vase showing, showing um, Athena with that thing. And here it is on her breastplate. If you go to the Museum of Fine Arts, you'll find a few terracotta. These are supposed to be the Aegis. These are supposed to be the shield. And they've got a little Medusa face in the middle. These are Roman. They're considerably later. And there's a, this is a reproduction uh, of a figure that's in white on a black pot, also in the Museum of Fine Arts. And it shows, here's uh, Athena. I'm sorry, this doesn't come out very well. But this is her Aegis, and she already has the Gorgon face on it, even as Perseus with, um, oh, sorry, Perseus over here with uh, Mercury in front of him is coming back carrying the head of Medusa. And here are the other two Gorgons over here, and here is uh, Medusa's body, and here's Pegasus and Chrysaor coming out of it. But Gorgon-like fields uh, faces are used on shields elsewhere as well. The Yatmu who live along the Sepik River in New Guinea until the present day still use shields that have faces that look like Gorgon faces. And the classical Mayans in Central America also did this. Here's a Yatmul shield. And here's another one. You can see it's got the large eyes, the nose, uh, and the protruding tongue. There's another one. This one's not so easy to make out. This is uh, a Mayan carving, but you can see the face there with the tongue. Here's another one. And this is probably the best one that I have. This is from a uh, standing figure. This is the shield, and you can see it's got the entire face with the, with the, the broad grin and the, the tongue sticking out as well. And the Mayans even had something like an Aegis. They had a breastplate that had a face in it like that. So possible answers. Assume the existence in many cultures of this icon, this staring face that's everywhere. That's the parallel of the Gorgon. They don't necessarily have the myth of the Gorgon, but they have something very much like it. Now assume that all these cultures independently discovered that it was not merely decorative, but useful. They didn't necessarily consciously realize this, but it came to be traditional to put them on that, and things worked better if you had that face on there for some reason. It was considered luckier probably, perhaps, or something. So I don't think that there was a common culture that spread this face of the Gorgon all over the world. I think people discovered it independently because it shows up um, all over the world in places popping up at completely different times and you can't draw a coherent um, pathway where the farther it gets from, us, from its origin, uh, the later in time it is. You can do that with some other features of myth, like the thunderbolt, for instance, the, the, the ancient image of the thunderbolt. You can trace from its origins in Egypt and Mesopotamia and farther out until the, the classic thunderbolt shows up all over the world from Spain to Japan. But the farther away you get from uh, there, the later it was introduced. You don't have that with the Gorgon. It just seems to pop up everywhere. Okay, so let's look at the antifixes. These are some circular tiles, close off the end of the row of roofing tiles, often decorated with the face. According to Pliny, he wrote about it. It was first done with a uh, potter named Butates. And it's usually a face. Um, Gorgon or Bacchus or some female deity but even when there is no face present, um, floral antifixes, which had flowers on it, resemble a face. So here are Bacchus faced antifixes, semicircular. It's got the face of uh, Bacchus on them with his pointed ears and his beard. But here's a, a floral antifix, and you can see these look like eyes. In fact, the fellow who wrote the definitive book about these called them Ocelli. He called them eyes. <coughs> here's another one. And here's yet another one. The horse's hooves over here are from a statue that was up at the top of the, along the edge of the building. But you have these two characteristic eyes here. You have this thing which looks like a nose and this even looks like a mouth. Um, you have an antifix that doesn't have to resemble a face but ended up looking like it anyway. Okay. So as I said, you close off the end of the tile. What would be the purpose of this? Well, if you look up without the antifix, 
just look up at this, you will see a row of, of dark holes going up along the edge of the roof. And that is particularly inviting to birds. It's exactly the place where birds like to nest. If you don't close off that, you not only have something that's ugly, you're inviting birds to come in there. In fact, one of the birds that's most ubiquitous in something like this is the starling because they roost in colonies. So this is photos of actual roof damage, tile roof damage caused by birds building nests in there. It shows you what can happen. So you put an antifix on there to prevent the birds from getting in. But as extra protection, it would be a good idea to put something on there that deterred the birds from coming around in the first place. And for that, you use the same strategy that's used by nature. Um, there are natural eye spots on a lot of creatures meant to scare away birds. This is a caterpillar, and it's got these eye spots on, well, sort of the shoulders. Here's the head down here. Um, when the bird comes along, this startles the birds, and the birds leave them alone. Here's a, here's a moth that has the eye spots on its, on its wings. It serves the same purpose. And here's another moth with something similar. So I'm not saying that people consciously saw this and imitated it. Uh, what I think happened was that people were using all sorts of patterns up there, all sorts of different things. They found that if they used ones that resembled a face, if they actually used a face or if they used a floral one, they found that if it more closely resembled a face, it was luckier, the roof lasted longer. They didn't know why, but it did work. And the same thing happened with gargoyles. People have asked, why do gargoyles have the shapes of these scary demons on them? What, what kind of sense does that make? And I maintain that here you've got a similar case. You have these round openings. Gargoyles, after all, are just, these are basically downspouts. Uh, they are meant to direct water away from the edge of a building and have it break into droplets and fall harmlessly away, some distance away. But if birds build their nests in here, it doesn't serve that purpose anymore. The water doesn't come out. So you deter that by putting a face on there that scares the birds away. Gargoyles didn't originate in the Middle Ages. They go all the way back to ancient history. Here's our Greek gargoyles on one of their temples in the shape of a lion head. And here's a photograph of one. This is from the Harvard Museum. And here's a Chinese gargoyle. They use the same thing along the edges of their roofs. In fact, there are even gargoyles in ancient Egypt. In Japan, to scare birds away from the rice fields, they had the Duruma figure. You might be with, familiar with the Duruma figure as a good luck charm that uh, people use. You buy it and it has neither of the eyes filled in. You're supposed to fill in one eye when you make a wish and fill in the other one when your wish comes true. But the old Daruma figures um, were actually already had the eyes. They weren't used as luck figures. They were used as scarecrows. The name Daruma, by the way, is short for Bodai Daruma, which is the Japanese form of Bodhidharma, which is the name of a monk who was famous for meditating for long periods of time. According to one myth, he cut off his own eyelids so that he wouldn't go to sleep. So the Daruma doll has no eyelids. Okay, the staring face was used on antifix and gargoyles because it acts as a passive bird deterrent. It's been demonstrated that things like that will keep birds away from fruit. You can buy these things called terrorized balloons um, the combination not only of having the huge eyes, but also having the thing moving adds enormously to it. A professor by the name of Ron Procopi at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst did an experiment where he put these out into fruit trees. Without this, they were getting depredations like a quarter of the fruit would be destroyed by birds coming along. Once he put these in place, the amount of fruit within 10 feet or so of this that were being attacked by the birds went down to less than 1%. And you had more attacks the farther and farther away you got from it. You can buy ceramic and plastic owls to, to use as bird deterrents. People buy them in stores all the time. They work, although they don't move around, so they work quite as well. In fact, this not only has the entire balloon moving, they use holographic or uh, lenticular patterns to make the eyes appear to be moving side to side as well, which is supposed to be particularly scary. <clears throat> but I've seen these in use at, for instance, Neshoba Valley, where they are effective at keeping the birds away. They had something like this in the ancient world. In uh, ancient Rome, they had something called oscilla. It comes from os, which means little face. It's the source of our word oscillate. They were little faces made out of something light. They made them out of cloth or out of uh, bark. 
Later on, they started making them out of stone, which didn't move so well. But according to Virgil in his poem, The Georgics, they were placed in pine trees. In art, you can see them used in olive trees and grapevines. Uh, here's a reproduction from a cup that shows them in a, in a grapevine. Here is a, um, an engraved uh, gem that shows several of these uh, in an olive tree. And here's another one. This is from a uh, wall painting that shows them in a grape thing. Now, again, the choice is significant because all of these have fruits that birds like to eat. Pine trees have pine nuts. Uh, olive trees, of course, have, have olives in them and uh, grape um, vines have grapes in them. I know from personal experience, birds will eat grapes. Um, I've collected reports of blackbirds um, uh, attacking and, and uh, depredating uh, olive uh, trees as well. And I don't have any doubt that uh, pine nuts are, uh, are eaten by, by birds. Certainly they are, but they don't, I haven't anything that shows they're being a nuisance there. Nevertheless, it's significant the three places these are shown are all places where um, there's something that birds would want to eat and that you want to keep the birds away from. They started making them out of marble. Here's a picture of one such. And here are some other marble uh, ocelli. They're not very useful. They don't move around as easily, but they could still hang them in the gardens. In fact, here's a reconstruction of a Pompeian villa. And this is the garden in the middle of it. And you can see halfway between each set of pillars, they have an oscillum hanging. Now that makes this image over here of Perseus holding the, the head of Medusa particularly interesting because it's just, that's just about the size and shape of one of the, uh, the marble acylli. So, and this did hang in a villa in Pompeii. So possibly the artist was having a bit of fun. He shows Perseus carrying a head of Medusa, but it's not the head of a life-size Medusa. It's one of the Medusas that's in the garden outside. Um, there are a few things I found that were that are called drinking bowl masks that I don't think are drinking bowl masks at all. These are obviously meant to be hung up by this. Uh, they have the the, the large eyes, uh, and they have an erect phallus over here. But that acts like a clapper. If you hang this up, this is made out of ceramic. It'll blow in the wind, and uh, the clapper will make it make noise. There are several different forms of these, and this one, in fact, has eye holes cut out, which make it a little bit like that lenticular terrorized balloon. It, uh, if, if there's light shows through here, it can make it look as if the eyes are even moving. So I think that the reason that you had the Gorgons as, on antifixes and on oscilli was because they acted as effective bird deterrents. It was a very practical purpose for them. Um, you also had terracotta busts suspended in graveyards, protome. And I think that kept the birds away from the gravestones and kept them from uh, you know, pooping on the gravestones. But let's look at something else. The staring eye face, the Medusa-like face is on shields. Why would it be on shields and breastplate, breastplates and armor? And again, you have analogs in China and Central America. And I think, again, people discovered the utility of this simultaneously. Um, this just illustrates uh, some work that had started being done in the early 20th century with people wanted to study gaze. They wanted to know why people looked at different parts and where they looked in particular. They came up with all sorts of innovative ways to see where the eye was pointing. And this shows the, that uh, great wave painting by uh, Hiroshige. And uh, this shows the gaze looking around at this. Well, if you put a human face in there, and this was the work of a fellow by the name of Yarbus, uh, Russian, who studied this in the 1950s and 60s. Here's a girl's face, and he's able to show where the gaze lingers and where it goes back to over and over again. And it keeps going back to the eyes and the mouth. It circles around to give an idea of the entire face, but it concentrates there. And it, even if it's not a human face, even if it's a lion's face, again, it concentrates on the eyes and the mouth. Here's another human face, and here overlaying it is where the, uh, the gaze spends all its time. The eyes are, uh, the, your eyes, your gaze is irresistibly drawn to that. It's even unconscious, does it without your willing it. Here's a painting, for instance, that shows someone arriving at someone's apartment. And where does the gaze go to over and over again? It goes to the heads. It's drawn there irresistibly to look at the heads. It spends some of the time elsewhere, but it inevitably looks over there. So Greek shields very often had eye-catching themes on them. 
In co of course, it has the Gorgon Ion, which uh, can't help but draw your gaze. It's got those eyes and you're forced to stare back at it. But sometimes they would put spirals in it, which is also eye catching or other geometrical figures. Uh, I've seen one that has a human leg on it, a female leg. So, and it's also used on the Aegis and it would be the same thing. The staring face is used on armor because it gave added protection. It diverted the antagonist's gaze. The person you're fighting against shouldn't be looking at your shield. He should be looking at where your arm is or where your gaze is or where you're about to strike him. But if it's drawn down to the shield, you've gained a momentary advantage over him. So, I've posited that everybody has these faces. They use them in the same places for the same reason. They're practical. But what is the origin of the staring face itself? What is it about the Gorgon that makes it so horrible? Why is it that the Gorgon was so terrible it would turn you into stone? It doesn't look that horrible. What hero would be turned away by something like that? Well, it turns out that there, there really is something terrifying about the face of the Gorgon. People have tried to figure out what it means. Some people thought it was storm clouds, and that's largely because the Aegis was seen as Zeus's storm cloud. Um, some people say it was large cats. Not only uh, the Gorgon, but an awful lot of the Gorgon parallels have feline features to them, or antelopes. Or one fellow posited that they were apes. They were the faces of apes because they have those, um, the features of an enraged ape, they, they, the staring eyes and everything and the teeth, which are bared when they're, they're challenging. Um, Jerome Letfin at MIT and several other people I've noticed since as well have suggested that it was a cephalopod, that the head of the Gorgon was basically <clears throat> an octopus or squid. The snakes were the tentacles and uh, the eyes were the very human-like eyes of uh, the octopus or squid. And even the protruding tongue could be explained as the siphon, this thing that the uh, the octopus squid uses to jet around. It's like a rubbery tube. And finally, people have suggested that it was inspired by nightmares. Some have tried to tra trace the staring face across cultures. Um, one person tried to follow, say that base from Egypt came over to Greece. Several people have claimed that uh, Humbaba, the, uh, the one that Gilgamesh fought, was the inspiration for the myth of Perseus Medusa. One followed the Chinese Dao Qie to, uh, to Polynesia and claimed it was the inspiration for those. Uh, others claimed that uh, from, from India it came to Greece, as many things were shown to. One even suggested that the Chinese Dao Qie influenced those figures in Pacific Northwest America. And um, one anthropologist claimed to be able to trace the uh, progress of this very figure from Central America up into Mexico. But again, I don't think these are the cases. I think all of these discovered it independently. Uh, and they independently discovered the uses of them. So what could it possibly have been? It must be available to cultures in all areas, near the seashore, on plateaus and jungles and rocky lands. Uh, if it was inspired by a cephalopod, it's kind of hard to see that as inspiring the face of Tonataya in the middle of the Aztec calendar stone a mile above sea level in uh, the middle of a landlocked state. Um, it can't be limited on geographic area. There aren't any apes in the Americas, so it's hard to see them doing that. And it can't be something that requires people to anthropomorphize it in the same way. Most people aren't gonna see storm clouds the same way or dreams. They're not going to, the, the way uh, a Greek sees the source around or a gleam, dream is not gonna be the same way that an ancient American does. It has to be something that is of common uh, human experience. And one of the few things I found that fit this, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to caution you on this because this really is uh, disturbing to several people, is this. This is the face of a human corpse after uh, several days without any embalming or treating. <clears throat> what happens is that um, the hair starts to separate, the uh, tissues start to bloat from the bacterial action, so the eyes protrude and the, uh, the tongue protrudes, and you tend to get lines on the face as well. You have all the same characteristics as a gorgon. Here's another uh, photograph of one such, and here's yet another. <clears throat> the protruding tongue and eyes are like staring, the hair separates, the face bloats, and the gorgon has the face of death. 
explains much of its mythology, explains why it is something that is so feared. It's uh, the face, uh, it's the appearance that even the loved one takes on after several days if it's not buried rapidly. The earliest reference in Greek mythology, Homer's Odyssey, Odysseus fears that Persephone will send up the Gorgon head from Hades. Um, it explains why they've got the snakes, because snakes are characteristics of underworld characters. Um, there's a Greek uh, painting, no longer existent, but described by Pausanias, that shows a Gorgon uh, in uh, a graveyard, in a tomb. Kali, Smashan Kali, haunts a graveyard. She is known as the goddess of the dead. The tiki figures are the figures of departed ancestors, and Mishtekutli and Tlatlikutli in Mexico were gods of the dead. So my progression of the Gorgon Eye in use goes like this. Image inspired by corpses, it becomes the widespread face of death, death demons seen all around the world. It's noted for its large eyes, even after the origin is forgotten. Used as an antifix because it scares birds, but it has those large eyes, so it's the obvious choice to use for that. It's used as shield armor because it distracts, and again, the large eyes help in that, which is why you have the Gorgon, used, Gorgon face used to the preference of others. It's used as the face of Perseus's monster because the blinking star Algol requires an eye monster. Um, that's part of the astronomical interpretation. The myth of decapitation common in Greece, Mesopotamia, and India because of the eye and head importance, and also because the head does, seem, uh, does tend to separate, especially in the case of drownings from the rest of the body. And the image is apotropaic, meaning that it scares things away because of the utility of the use on antifixes and shields and because of the visceral reaction to staring eyes. The face is used on ovens, it's used on cups, it's used on coins, it's used on all sorts of things to keep away evil influences in the evil eye the same way it keeps away birds, the same way it distracts uh, other people. Okay, so that is the end of this part of the lecture. Um, I've got about uh, 15 minutes left. I just want to point out that after the use in, fell away in the ancient world, uh, the Gorgon was rediscovered um, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, I think in large part simply because it was such a captivating figure. And at that point, the snakes, which were very rare and generally only showed up occasionally to show that it was an underworld figure, became ubiquitous. They, the snakes started showing up in place of the hair. And uh, if you look at the paintings that appear in uh, the Renaissance, it doesn't look out at you. I think that the, the artists were suggesting that you couldn't look at it because it would be turned to stone. So in paintings that were done by um, several different artists, the eyes are staring off to one side, but they had very realistic snakes on them. Um, Perseus became the subject of many compositions. He was the very first opera was about Perseus and Medusa. And uh, he's always shown, he, he, th th this is where Pegasus became the steed of uh, Perseus. Uh, he needed some way to come in. His myth had always been associated with, with horses. So um, he started riding the horse. He rides a horse there. It's not just born from the head after his death. Um, and it started showing up in written sources the same way. Um, when Ray Harryhausen made the movie uh, Clash of the Titans for the first time in 1981, of course, he rides a flying Perseus. And he is the origin, I think, of another trope that has come around, which is Medusa with the body of a snake. Medusa didn't have the body of the snake. In classical art, she usually has the body of a woman with wings, although sometimes she has the body of a bird. And in one case, she even has the body of a horse, a sort of Gorgon centaur, but never, never a snake. The Greeks did have figures that had snake bodies, but the Medusa, the Gorgon was not one of them. Um, but Harryhausen liked it and it gave him another way to bring the snake imagery in. So he uh, copied something he had done in an earlier movie and gave his Medusa the body of a snake. And now that's in an awful lot of places when she showed up in the remake of Clash of the Titans, she has, uh, she has a snake's body as well. Also because Medusa is one of the very few well-known female figures in Greek mythology who did something that everyone knows about, she became a powerful feminist image she started showing up in women's poems in the 1950s and thereon, and she became a figure of female empowerment and symbol of female rage. Rage, obviously, because she's obviously angry. She's um, um, turning people into stone. Um, 
so if you look, you will find her in an awful lot of works. I haven't got any of my fingertips right now, but there are drawings of her on the covers of an awful lot of feminist books showing her as almost a patron saint of, of women. That thing, by, by the way, about turning into stone doesn't come from any of these other things, but uh, one of the things Lichten had suggested was that the uh, parallel with the cephalopod um, encourages the belief that, it, that uh, things turn to stone because when cephalopods enter the area, the creatures that are possible prey freeze in place. They don't move. So let's see, it's 7.50 now. I think I'll leave it there because I've about run out of time. And I'll turn this back over to uh, Robert. Robert? I'm here, Stephen. <laughs> I was going to give you the five minute warning at eight o'clock. So you, okay. you beat me to it. Um, so let's do this. Let me start my video here. I'm going to end the recording. And <laughs>